take a moment to reflect on just how far this league has come. What a century of hockey at its highest level looks like, and feels like, and sounds like. It's then you'll understand just why the National Hockey League has meant so much to so many. Think of the game then as a link between people and places and time. Think of it more than anything else as a connector of generations. What is undoubtedly true about hockey is that when it appears, it captivates the imagination of the country as a pastime. From 1875 to 1893, hockey goes from something that really doesn't exist as a sport to being the country's number one passion in virtually every part of the country. French Canadians play it. Aboriginal Canadians play it. Immigrants play it. Poor people play it. Wealthy people play it. In the early days, the club is the basis of the organization. Clubs play exhibitions. Eventually, the exhibitions become some kind of regular competition. That becomes a league. The big transition for hockey is the formation of the NHL. The National Hockey League is the organization that becomes the long-term viable business. History tells us the NHL is 100 years old. But as a professional game, hockey has been around even longer than that. In Canada, before the NHL, there was the National Hockey Association, a league that, like the rest of the country, was devastated by World War I. The sport's in desperate trouble. A lot of the best players are fighting, and they've left the game. It's hard for us to imagine how bad World War I really was. The casualty rates were just astronomical. Alan Scotty Davidson, who was the captain of the Toronto Blue Shirts, who won the Stanley Cup in 1914. So imagine, if you will, he's being presented with the Stanley Cup, and then the next spring, you know, he's over in France, killed in a trench raid. The owners at the time are trying to figure out a way how to keep their league going. And one of the things they decide to do is to grant the 228th Battalion, the Northern Fusiliers, a franchise in the NHA. Unthinkable, unheard of, where you have a professional league with a battalion, a military battalion, having its own team. Subsequently, it was a bit of an absurd ending that they realized that they actually had to ship out to, <laughs> to France, and they, you know, literally on the Friday before they were supposed to play a game, they abandoned the league. The Toronto team also collapsed, which was part of the story of the formation of the NHL. The majority of the owners of those hockey teams couldn't get along and didn't like the Toronto owner. That owner was Eddie Livingstone a bit of a lone wolf and a thorn in the side to the rest of the owners. And they essentially called a meeting behind his back and they met over several days at the Windsor Hotel in Montreal. They decide to rename the National Hockey Association and give everybody a franchise except Eddie Livingstone. And the owners formed this new league, the National Hockey League, the NHL, excluding Livingstone. Soon after that meeting, the National Hockey League was officially formed on November 26, 1917. It began with four teams, all in Canada, two in Montreal, one in Toronto, and one in Ottawa. The first pucks dropped on December 19, 1917, and, uh, and things really went off with a bang. The Wanderers beat the Toronto Hockey Club 10-9, and that was really the high point for the Wanderers. After that, they didn't win another game, and their arena burned down. That first year, the Toronto Arenas came out as champions and played for the already 25-year-old Stanley Cup against the Vancouver Millionaires of the Pacific Coast Hockey Association. Toronto won, but the league still had a long way to go. By the end of the first year of the NHL, you're down to three teams. It is barely surviving. 
war ends, unfortunately what happens is a bunch of guys come back and they bring the Spanish influenza with them. And you have a plague that kills millions and millions of people in North America. The Spanish flu was a flu that actually attacked the healthiest citizens. So athletes were particularly susceptible. In the fall of 1918 is when the flu was really at its worst. A player named Hamby Shore, who played for Ottawa and had played for years, died in October of 1918 before the season started. That season, the Montreal Canadiens won the league. But when they traveled out west to play for the 1919 Stanley Cup against the Seattle Metropolitans of the Pacific Coast Hockey Association, the influenza outbreak was so prevalent, it forced the cancellation of the cup. And just four days after that, the death of Canadian's defenseman Joe Hall. Yet despite all of its off-ice issues, the league somehow soldiered on. All the more remarkable considering the on-ice product was often nothing much to look at, and at times, even harder to see. Lighting is terrible. It would be equivalent now to watching hockey with a handful of flashlights. It's, it's that dim. Players in the very early days are wearing almost no equipment. They were less protected and uh, more apt to be bloodied at the end of a game. They were all taught to use their sticks. Heavy duty weapons, they weren't as long as they are today, but they were heavy and did some damage. Guys would get gashes and cuts and lose teeth, but they'd be back out in the ice. If you go back to the, the very early professional hockey, the game would look radically different. No forward passing as we now know it. And it was basically one line that played the entire game, and if somebody was injured or exhausted, well, then they'd put a spare out at that point. So the shifts could have been well, 20 minutes long. The goalies up until January of 1918 could not leave their feet to make a save. The NHA had even gone so far as to try to penalize goaltenders for doing this, even invoking a $2 fine. Frank Calder, who was the president of the NHL at the time, said, I don't really care how goaltenders make saves, they can stand on their heads for all I care. And that has given us that line that we still use today when a goaltender's uh, having an incredible game, we say that he's standing on his head. Through it all, the early NHL was actually high scoring, with players like Phantom Joe Malone, who had started his career in the National Hockey Association. By 1917, Malone was with the Montreal Canadiens and scored 44 goals in 20 games. Two years later, he had seven in a single game, a record that still stands. Gradually, the game began to produce several more recognizable players, like Cy Denany of the Ottawa Senators and his teammate King Clancy, as well as the league's first superstar, Montreal's Howie Morenz, a three-time most valuable player. And then there was the diminutive netminder, recognized as the NHL's first great goaltender, the Shakutami Cucumber, George Vesna. He was around 16 years old when he finally got on skates and started playing for his local team in Shakutami, which is in northern Quebec. The Montreal Canadiens had traveled north to Shakutami to play an exhibition game against the local club. And Vesna was backstopping his team. And incredibly, the local boys had somehow bested the Montreal Canadiens. And everyone to a man is like, uh, sign this guy. And they do. So Vesna, you know, gets pulled from the crowd almost like, you know, Chikudumi's got talent kind of contest. Vesna went on to play 16 seasons for the Montreal Canadiens, at one point starting 328 consecutive games. He helped the Habs win their first two Stanley Cups before he died at the age of just 39. By the early 1920s, the NHL was now made up of four teams, all still in Canada. While it couldn't really be called a success, it wasn't a failure either, until the owners recognized that just to the south lay a vast land of wealth and opportunity they simply couldn't pass up. It was a great market that was untapped at this point, and they, they had to go into the United States. Once you come into the States, phenomenal market. This is almost like what it was like for America to make the Louisiana Purchase. I mean, look at what the heck you're getting here. 
Roaring Twenties changes everything in the NHL. It's competing with so many different interests at the time, including the silver screen, which is breaking out. To be a competitive entertainment force, one of the things they do is introduce these ice palaces. When they opened, they were new and modern and huge. Madison Square Garden was a huge rink. The Boston Garden, when it opened, they were bigger than the rinks in Toronto and, and in Montreal and in Ottawa in particular. Chicago had that organ right from the beginning. It was the Madhouse on Madison right from the start. You could put 16 to 18,000 people in there and it was, they were, it was a revelation. It was an event. Going out to the hockey game was not necessarily unlike going to the opera or going to the symphony. Row upon row upon row, the women are in furs and the men are wearing fedoras and they're wearing their suits. Like any enterprise in that robust time, the NHL was simply looking to increase revenues. In all, there were now 10 teams, four in Canada, with two in Montreal, one in Ottawa, and one in Toronto, by now known as the Maple Leafs. In the States, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Boston, and Chicago all had teams, while New York had two, one of whom, the Rangers, in 1928, became the first team based in America to win the Stanley Cup, although it was under unusual circumstances. Their goaltender, Lauren Chabot, gets hit by the Montreal Maroons' Nell Stewart. Knocks him clean out. He's done. This day and age, they do not have backup goalies per se. There are goalies that are in the audience that are asked to come down and come on in. There was a goalie in the audience that night, and it was Alex Connell from Ottawa. But the Maroons coach, Eddie Girard, said, no, you can't use him. One of your players will have to suit up. So Lester had to make a decision. Who do I have to play goal? Talked it over with the team, and he said, I'm gonna go in. He was 44 years old. So he gets a Lauren Chabot sweaty and probably bloody hats and gear on and goes in that. He lets one goal in, that's it. Now, unfortunately, the Rangers only score one goal too, so it has to go to overtime. But the Rangers win in overtime. But by the end of the decade, the league's heady days, like most everything else, soon came crashing down. The onset of the Great Depression hit both the States and Canada equally hard. There were some teams that struggled very badly. A number of them collapsed. Uh, the Canadians were on the brink of collapse, but they did survive. Montreal, of course, has two teams historically, a French team and an English team. The English team is the Maroons. They don't survive. Pittsburgh moves briefly to Philadelphia, doesn't survive. And then, of course, the Ottawa Senators, a team that had gone back to the 1880s. They go to St. Louis briefly, but they ultimately don't survive either. They were struggling even before the Depression hit. They were kind of a classic small market team even then. So, you know, losing four of 10-team league is no small thing. It is really remarkable that the NHL survived the next decade and a half leading up to and through World War II, when the only constant was instability. Back then, visionaries kept the league in business, like Maple Leafs owner Con Smythe, who in the midst of the Great Depression somehow managed to build Maple Leaf Gardens in 1931. Meanwhile, his team, who had acquired veteran defenseman King Clancy from Ottawa, along with the kid line of Joe Primo, Harvey, Busher Jackson, and Charlie Conacher won the Stanley Cup the first year in their new building. But for much of the 1930s, the better teams were in the United States, along with many of the best players. When the New York Rangers won in 1933, they did so with Frank Boucher and the Cook brothers, Bun and Bill, all Hall of Famers while the Boston Bruins had the one player as skilled and feared as any in the league, the incomparable Eddie Shore. The opponents were scared of him. You know, they gave him enough of a lane so that by the time he reached the blue line of his opponent, he already had a full head of steam. He played with the ferocity of Ty Cobb, with an edge 
of menace was very compelling. You couldn't take your eyes off him when he was playing. But his box office helped the league in the way that Babe Ruth helped establish Major League Baseball in the wake of the Black Sox scandal. For example, he was the first hockey player ever profiled in the New Yorker magazine. Eddie Shore had everything to do with making the sport significant in America. Shore might have been front page news in the States, but he was far from an angel on the ice. They were playing against Toronto in 1933. He gets body checked by Red Horner. Shore is furious and he looks up and, and whether he was in a confused state or whether it didn't matter to him, but he found the first blue sweater he could find and knocked them into tomorrow. Mistakenly spied Ace Bailey, the most sportsmanlike player on the Leafs. Bailey hit the ice headfirst in an impact that's, that caused a skull fracture. Bailey gets rushed to the hospital down in Boston, and they don't think he's going to make it. They bring in a priest, they call for his family to come down. There's a picture of Eddie Shore showing him identified as public enemy number one that was published in a Boston paper. He was vilified for this. This was beyond the pale. Eventually, Bailey would recover, but never play hockey again. His injury, however, did lead to a charity event in 1934 to help his family financially in what's now recognized as the NHL's first all-star game. There is a famous photograph of the two of them shaking hands, Shore in his uniform, Bailey in street clothes. That response really saved not only Eddie Shore, but also helped salvage the reputation of the league. Highs and lows were a hallmark of the early NHL. Teams came and went with regularity. In Detroit, the Red Wings would eventually become one of the league's more successful franchises. But during the formative years, when they were known first as the Cougars and later the Falcons, the team was closer to bankruptcy than championships. By that time, Jack Adams was reduced to going door to door up and down Grand River trying to sell or trade uh, tickets to that night's game, to the local grocer, the bakery, and so forth. And to the rescue comes James Norris. James Norris was a wealthy Canadian grain merchant who had failed in two previous attempts to buy into the NHL. When he was finally successful in purchasing the Detroit franchise in 1932, he quickly proved to be an astute businessman with a flair for innovation. He introduced matinee games to the NHL. They'd always been played at night before. He allowed ticket buyers to buy their tickets in installments. That was a first for the NHL. And then he started beefing up the lineup. In terms of hockey history and Red Wings history, the greatest single thing that James Norris did was introduce the famous wing wheel to the Detroit uniform and change the name of the team to the Red Wings. Within three years, um, they were playing in the cup finals. They lost to Chicago, but a couple years later, they won their first Stanley Cup and repeated the following year. In time, Norris would go on to become one of the more influential owners in the NHL, so much so that his imprint, like many of the game's early pioneers, is found today on the league's most prestigious awards. The Norris Trophy is handed out to the league's top defenseman, while the Rookie of the Year gets the Frank Calder Trophy. What a play! named after the league's first president, who served from 1917 until his death in 1943. Here's Connor McDavid. The leading scorer is given the Art Ross Trophy. And he's in and he scores! In honor of one of the game's first great innovators. There's also an award given out at the Hockey Hall of Fame, named after Foster Hewitt, the legendary broadcaster with an unforgettable voice and undeniable effect on the league's formative years. He's in close, he shoots, he scores! Foster Hewitt created the language of the game. He shoots, he scores. The very fundamental things that everyone needed to describe the game and made it into a, a three-act play that he was a star in. You can imagine sitting around a transistor radio out on the prairies of Canada listening to Foster Hewitt say, Hello, Canada. 
and hockey, hockey fans, fans of the United States and Newfoundland. Well, it, it would be almost like he was in a wind tunnel fading in, <laughs> in and out. It was humbling to be presented with an award that has his name on it. When they asked him about a good location for the brand new Maple Leaf Gardens, he determined what the proper distance and the height would be to broadcast a hockey game. And so his famous gondola was not just an accident, it was done with a lot of work on his part. It became the way to be attuned to hockey. Hello, Canada and hockey fans in the United States. We're at the eight minute mark, there's no score. There's a shot, score! Oh! The other thing that you have to remember about Foster is that he really brought great entertainment to the, the war effort as well. And an extra big hello to Canadian servicemen overseas. Broadcasts of hockey games were shipped over to Europe, so it was much bigger than just in houses across Canada. It was across the ocean as well. Up to the blue line, gaining speed to center. In the years just prior to World War II, hockey might have been Canada's game, played mostly by Canadians but the Stanley Cup champions were still teams from the United States. The Chicago Blackhawks somehow won in 1938 after winning just 14 regular season games. And the New York Rangers took their third Stanley Cup in 1940. But it was the Boston Bruins with the famed Kraut line of Bobby Bauer, Woody Dumart, and Milt Schmidt that was recognized as the NHL's best team. Bobby was the brains of the line, and Woody and myself listened to Bobby, and uh, we got along quite well. And they grew up in the same hometown in Ontario, Kitchener, Ontario. They all got the same salary. They lived in the same boarding house in Brookline, Mass. At one point, they led the league in scoring one, two, and three. It's remarkable. They were a real-life three musketeers and that it was truly one for all, all for one. The Kraut line led the Bruins to two Stanley Cups, the first in 1939 and the second in 1941. A dynasty seemed in order. World War II would get in the way, although it did provide for one of the more remarkable moments in league history. The last game that we played before going into the service, after the game was over, all of a sudden the Montreal Canadiens hoisted Bobby, Woody, and myself on their shoulders. That was really something, because they were bitter enemies until then. A few years later, at the height of World War II, the NHL's first 25 years came to an end. The founding era was over, and the days of the original six about to begin.